Okay, so welcome to our webinar uh, talking about sourcing bolts for mushroom cultivation. My name is Steve Gabriel. I'm an extension specialist with the Cornell Small Farms Program. We are housed at the main campus of Cornell University in New York State. We do a lot of collaboration with uh, county extensions all over New York, as well as collaborations with many individuals and organizations down in New York City, as well as in the Northeast and beyond. Uh, happy to have you here. You can find more about our project at cornellmushrooms.org and more broadly about the Small Farms Project at smallfarms.cornell.edu. So today we're going to talk about um, sourcing logs and some of the considerations. Uh, you may be on the uh, buyer end looking for your logs, looking to source your own logs. You might be on the seller end, or you might find yourself somewhere in between, just interested in um, the potential of this uh, opportunity. If you visit our website, we recently expanded um, the way our website is organized. So on every page, you'll find this set of uh, buttons to orient you to our different resources for the Mushroom Project. The content that I'll mention in this webinar, as well as the recording, will be posted under the supply page. In the supply page, we talk about um, places where you can source materials for mushroom cultivation. So spawn supply companies, companies that supply tools and other materials. And then all this kind of log sourcing stuff will be housed there. So you can find that easily. Just visit the home page and then click on that find supply link. You can also uh, use the link on the bottom of the page if you want to uh, write that down and, and use that to access this and other resources. And we'll talk about a few other opportunities we have, but our website is a comprehensive resource for all things mushroom, indoor production, outdoor production, considerations for economics and marketing. And, um, and our community mushroom educator uh, component where we're training and working with a wide range of folks uh, doing education out in the field around mushrooms. So lots to check out there. I encourage you to check it out and, and keep in touch with us. Um, and we're excited. This is the spring of 2021. We're excited for some new additions. You can see there um, some ways we're gonna organize our resources and hopefully make them uh, more visible for everybody. So we're going to talk about bolts, and, um, and specifically, this is a word that just seems to have emerged in the mushroom cultivation world. Um, just to differentiate, when we're talking, especially with folks familiar with sort of the wood products industry, uh, familiar with using logs um, as a term. So we just use bolt to differentiate uh, wood that is intended to be used for mushroom cultivation. Um, you can see here in the picture, these are bolts I got delivered to my farm now several years ago um, these were delivered in six foot lengths because that was a convenient length for the distributor um, uh, and then we cut them into three foot lengths like you can see in the front of the photo um, so first what we're going to talk about is sort of the characteristics of what a good bolt is and uh, what that would look like what type of species those sort of things and then we'll dive into some of the details about sourcing them buying them selling them that sort of thing so i think to summarize we could say that a good bolt is something that's freshly cut it's of the desired species and it's minimally damaged, meaning the exterior bark is not um, gone or falling off or scuffed too much. And so we'll talk about kind of each of those characteristics as we go through here. But um, especially if you are um, buying bolts, you're gonna be paying a premium to the provider and you wanna make sure that the standards that you're seeking are really clear to that, um, to that person. Uh, before purchasing or before that delivery shows up at the at the place you are. Um, and if you're a seller, you want to pay attention to these things. And if you're used to working with wood uh, and forestry, um, you often don't have to care too much about the quality and the handling of the logs. And that's the biggest difference for folks who are doing the woods work and paying attention to those kind of details. So a lot of our work is focused around log grown shiitake, both for hobby and commercial use. And the main selling point for that is its reliable, consistent production, which we can get in our part of New York State, Central New York, um, generally from sometime in early June through sometime in mid to late October. So you can have weekly uh, harvests from your logs. Um, pretty much all the other mushroom species will fruit periodically on a seasonal basis. So we'll start with shiitake here. Um, we do have an extensive uh, guidebook on our website under the outdoor mushroom cultivation section, all about shiitake cultivation. So we won't get into the details about how to do it, but in terms of sourcing bolt wood for shiitakes, um, we have identified over the years many different types of species. This is not a comprehensive list, um, but 
the, the most preferred or the most common would be the oak species, sugar maple, American beech, and then sort of um, maybe less common or less used, but also uh, many growers reporting good results and success from American hornbeam, hop hornbeam, and birch. There are other species that will work. Then there are many species that won't work for shiitake, but these are kind of the, the tiers. And when I'm approaching a buyer, um, I try to emphasize that these are the ones I'm interested in and clarify that sometimes they think of hard maple and soft maple, hard maple being sugar maple, soft maple being red maple or silver maple. Um, I'm only interested in the hard maple, the sugar maple for shiitake. All right. For some of our other species of mushrooms we want to grow, we can expand the list of potential wood species. Um, for oyster, generally speaking, we look for deciduous trees that have uh, softer wood, um, poplar, elder, willow, very common uh, used for this. And lion's mane, um, most commonly grown on sugar maple or beech. These, both these methods are generally, uh, the inoculation of these mushrooms is generally um, not a, a small diameter log that you drill holes into, but actually a larger diameter log that you stand up, cut into sections, and then layer the mushroom mycelium in. As you can see with the lion's mane there on a stump, we just made some chainsaw cuts and layered sawdust spawn in between those cuts to get our lion's mane. So the difference between a, a bolt inoculation and a stump is just the diameter of the log. So for bolts, we're generally wanting logs that are four to eight inches in diameter. Um, you could go larger than that, but you'll find them hard to move around. And that's a key feature for shiitake in particular is we want something that's comfortable for us to, to move around our growing system. Uh, for oyster and lion's mane, we can go with much larger diameter logs and we stack them and, and sort of set them upright, whether it's an actual stump or a, a piece of log that we just stand upright in the forest. So we can go with much larger diameters such as um, 8, 10, 12, even 14 or 16 inch diameters. Um, Namiko is, uh, or Nameko is a mushroom that's um, gaining some interest in and um, is relatively easy to uh, produce, uh, mostly a fall fruiting mushroom, mostly grown on bolts, again, that smaller diameter wood, uh, and mostly using black cherry or sugar maple as a wood substrate. And then I'm seeing more and more folks experimenting with turkey tail. You can buy turkey tail spawn and produce this. This is a mushroom that's primarily used uh, for its medicinal purposes. You can dry it and use it as a tea or, or make an extract. Um, and that can be grown on actually a lot of different types of hardwoods. Um, we don't really, uh, we've never done any research in particular. We have seen it grow. And in nature, you see it growing on all sorts of different um, deciduous trees. And you'll note here that uh, we're focused on deciduous or, or the leaf bearing trees. That's really what we're talking about with mushrooms. We don't have um, many, if any, species that are going to be consistently cultivated on, on conifers. Um, there are some, of course, you can find in the woods, but in terms of reliable home cultivation methods, they're just, they just aren't established enough yet to really understand. So the timing of the cut, so I said freshly cut is a really important characteristic. Um, you can actually do this any time of the year. We did research at Cornell to show that you could cut and inoculate shiitake logs any month of the year, and they will work. They were slightly better when we did it in the summer or the, or, excuse me, in the spring or in the fall, um, but it wasn't uh, substantially different. Um, things we want to think about. So often um, cutting logs in the dormant season is ideal. And that's partially because um, the ground is hopefully frozen. There's less damage to the woods doing that work. The, the logs are fully dormant, meaning the moisture is, is held within the wood. And then you have a reduction in potential contaminants, i.e. other fungi and microbes that might um, uh, feast on the wood and, and beat you to that, uh, beat you to your inoculations. So that's ideal. Um, it's also ideal from a commercial standpoint, if you're thinking about a, a cycle of inoculation, letting those logs incubate and then having them fruit. It's nice to uh, inoculate them early in the season so that they have the full growing season in order to do that initial um, spawn run. So a lot of commercial growers will aim to harvest and inoculate their logs in early spring so they, so they can take uh, advantage of that. That being said, life happens. Uh, here we are in, in late spring, uh, certainly um, breaking dormancy in many senses. And so um, we may have missed the window for um, some ideal window, but again, our research showed that it, it didn't truly matter. So I think um, timing is, is not of the essence. What's key is that you want to um, inoculate wood that was recently cut. So uh, at least um, younger than three months. I wouldn't wait longer than three months from something being cut or falling over to turn that into a mushroom log. Um, and sooner the better. Um, so some resources will cite needing to let the log sit for several weeks. Um, 
before inoculating, but our research didn't really show that. So, so cut and inoculate as soon as possible is really our approach to this. Um, in the springtime, I will say that it's important to think about things like bark slip. We found with um, American beech, for instance, that when the sap is running and the trees are, are leafing out, um, sometimes the bark is, um, is pretty moist and can fall off or get really easily damaged. I've seen that on some uh, sugar maple varieties as well, like younger ones and ones where the bark isn't so developed. Not such a problem with oak and things like that, but can show up. So when the sap is running, you might not have the bark sort of as attached or locked in as you would, and there can be a potential for increased bark damage. So keep an eye on that. If it seems like you're, you're beating up your logs, you might wanna wait a bit. We usually recommend you either cut your logs before trees bake, break bud and start to really run um, with sap or wait till they fully leaf out and things are kind of stabilized again before you cut them. Um, and so timing is good when you, when you cut them. Um, they can be stored for, um, again, several weeks, even a few months. Again, if I was sourcing logs, if I was buying them, I would really want to emphasize with the person I was buying them from that I'd like them to cut them, load them onto something, and then bring them to me as soon as possible. Not let them sit out in the woods for, you know, for months on end. This isn't <clears throat> this isn't firewood where we're aging it or something like that. We want to make sure our logs are free of any disease. Um, and so, um, these are examples of fungal cankers that show up um, on many of the the wood that we're harvesting. In this case, um, you can see this is on a part of a log and I could actually cut on either side of this canker and find clean um, uninfected wood and use the rest of that uh, log for inoculation. But I certainly don't wanna try to inoculate the burl or, or the sort of um, infection there, whether it's alive or, or dormant at that point. Um, so again, if you're sourcing logs, you're buying them. Um, I think there's, there's a low threshold or a zero threshold for having logs show up with disease on them and you know, protruding from the bark on the outside. So these are exterior fungal diseases that show up on trees. Um, sometimes uh, the bark may look really good on one side and you turn it around, you, you notice that actually it's, it's quite decayed on the inside there. So here's an example of that. So inspect your logs if you're purchasing them um, or pay attention. Again, this is something that often you can cut on either side of it and kind of remove it and use the rest of the tree um, for mushroom cultivation. Um, heart rot is, is, is a little different. So um, this is actually a, a heart rot in the tree that, that infiltrated the outer bark, actually wanted to get to the inner wood of the tree and then grow out from the center um, versus these um, sort of uh, um, surface fungus that are kind of coming in from the outside and more interested in the exterior bark or the inner bark or the cambium itself. So with heart rot, um, what we see here is a fungus that shows up and then kind of grows out from the, from the center. And um, what you'll notice is, is what it tends to do is, is create a condition where uh, the tree is getting stained. And so you can often see this evidenced in many trees. Um, what we'd want to think about in terms of acceptability for mushroom cultivation is that the heart rot is not so extensive that it's all the way out to the living cambium, which is just that papery thin layer um, between the inner bark and the, and the sapwood here, right? So if it's this infected, I don't know if I would say it's worth my time inoculating this, but often we have trees with heart rot that's just a small uh, disc or, or a small you know, inner part of the wood, but there's several inches still of clean wood and I would consider that acceptable for, for mushroom cultivation. And then as far as damage goes, you know, this is acceptable bark damage. I can put some wax on that when I inoculate, it'll, it'll be fine. Um, what I don't wanna see is large strips coming off the bark. Um, uh, large plates of the bark coming off or any, um, any excessive damage that would both inter, uh, potentially expose the log to outside contaminants and also help it um, lose moisture. So the bark is really like the jacket of the wood. It keeps it protected from contaminants and from, from moisture loss. And so I would, I would say if you're buying logs especially, or if you're selling them, you wanna aim for, for a less than 10% damage overall in your, in your crop. And so, you know, the, the timing of harvest I mentioned can be a factor if the sap's running, um, the handling of the logs, we're not gonna skid our logs out of the woods because that's gonna cause probably excessive damage. Um, probably hand handling is, is gonna be the name of the game. And then even with that, um, tossing them around, throwing them against each other, you can really increase the damage. So it's important to emphasize, again, if you're gonna pay 
for your logs to make sure that the, the purveyor is used to, or, or I should say understands um, that you need them to be handled well and that you actually won't pay for them <laughs> if they're not in good shape. Um, and that can take some training early on. Again, folks that are working the woods out there, they're used to banging stuff around. It's not really a big deal because if you're harvesting logs for firewood or, or even for wood products or timber, you really often don't give, give much about the, um, about the bark itself. So, uh, so just keep that in mind. It's something to convey. I once had to um, turn away a seller because the logs were so damaged and I had communicated that clearly. And that can be an awkward situation that I hope everyone can avoid in the future. So in addition to those kind of main parameters, when we think about, <clears throat> again, either I'm, I'm thinking I wanna source some logs from somebody or I potentially wanna be a log seller. Uh, we also wanna connect our, our harvest of wood to, to good forest management. And we're not gonna um, dig um, all the way into this. Of course, forest management is a, a lifelong practice, something to learn, something to connect with. And there are resources to help you learn that um, or understand it. Because again, if you're not um, working in the woods or having access to woods, but you're buying logs, it's important to convey to a potential log provider what's important to you about making sure that the logs they're selecting are of good quality and also are helping the, the forest um, long-term as well. And there's good matchups between um, where we can harvest wood for mushroom cultivation and store the forest at the same time. So I'll point you to this resource again on the, su the supplier page. We have a, a link to this video. This is also on our Cornell Small Farm um, YouTube channel. This is a specific uh, presentation from State Extension Forester Peter Smallage about um, forest ecology in relationship to, to harvesting mushroom bolts. So um, this would be a, a, its own webinar and we already have it recorded for you. And I really recommend you watch it and, and dig in it. It does cover things like tree ID, some of the basic ecologies and patterns and principles that we see and how we think about um, harvesting trees and, and maybe not just for mushroom logs, but for a variety of uses. So the slide here talking about, you know, selecting trees um, to benefit the forest health, but then also thinking about what products we could utilize that wood for. So really highly recommend that as a resource. Also recommend you check out with your local cooperative extension. Um, often there's uh, master forest owner programs or um, there's maybe a forest owners association around you that does forest walks and, and tree ID things and, and, and to familiarize yourself with folks in your local community who might be um, good resources to, to learn more about the woods and, and how, um, how sustainable harvesting can be done um, for mushrooms. What I'll share a, a bit about is just some, some thinking around some connections between uh, forestry and, and mushroom cultivation. And, we have to actually take a step back and, and think about where mushroom uh, farming comes from. So this is a practice that in parts of Korea, China, and Japan has been going on for thousands of years. This photo here is actually from a, a mushroom farm that has been um, continuously stewarded for several centuries uh, in Japan uh, on the island of Kyushu. And um, these are logs, these are a sawtooth oak, um, um, an oak species that are harvested, you can see on a rotation where there's a clear cutting system going on. So small clear cuts, and they're actually coppicing and regrowing trees, uh, mushroom logs, I should say, from the same stump. So this is a regenerative practice that um, is, is rooted in the concept that if you cut a tree down at its base and you give it um, adequate light, it'll re-sprout and regrow and you can actually craft small pole wood from that base. And you, that is a renewable resource that you can continue to do. So these are generally done on 15 to 20 year um, rotations. Well, they'll, they'll um, cut, walk away, and then come back 15 and 20 years later to harvest another round of bolts. So really amazing, sustainable long-term system. Um, we unfortunately don't have these established. It's nice to walk into one of these and imagine just harvesting this material, but that certainly takes many generations to establish um, such a rich resource. And um, uh, the key thing I want to take away from, from this understanding and where shiitake culture comes from is that this wood, because it's open grown, it's grown in full light conditions, the predominant um, com composition of this wood is, is sapwood. And from our best understanding, we don't have all the answers. Um, shiitake and other of the, the main mushrooms that we're talking about cultivating really feed mostly on the sapwood. They can decompose the inner wood or the heartwood to some degree, but really it's the sapwood. So we may not have access to a coppice grove like this to have fully open grown wood, but we want to take that lesson as we think about where to ideally source our logs from. 
So this idea of sapwood to heartwood ratio is as the tree grows, it's, it's putting on more and more rings of growth and the outer rings are actually containing sap and nutrients. The inner um, wood is essentially structural. It's biologically more or less dead. Um, it does have some uh, moisture and some nutrition in it, but not as much as the sapwood. So given the, the conditions in a forest you might be getting logs from, um, you may have a larger sapwood to heartwood ratio or a smaller one. And for mushroom cultivation, we would certainly prefer to have a larger, as much sapwood as possible, okay? So one way to tell this is if I have a four inch diameter log, well, how many rings are there in that log? How many rings per inch is sometimes a way this is measured? Because that gives you a good sense. You could have a log that is four inches in diameter and is only 25 years old. And you could have a log that's four inches in diameter that's 95 years old. And so that 95 year old log is likely gonna have a much higher uh, amount of heartwood in it. And the younger log, of course, is gonna have more sapwood, right? So what are the conditions that create um, some of these things. So when we're looking at forests, these are, uh, you know, it's a very common sort of uh, sugar maple forest around us. While it might look like in this photo, um, these trees are of different ages, you know, drastically different diameters. We have the tree in the middle here, which might be um, 16 inches in diameter. And then we have kind of stepping down to very small saplings. And, and when, when folks unfamiliar often walk into these forests, they think, oh, well, the the larger trees are the parents and the younger trees are the, you know, the baby saplings that are the next generation. But in most cases, the next generation is actually in the understory of that forest. It's the saplings that you see, the, the really the seedlings that we see on the forest floor, but everything up in the canopy, whether it's suppressed and not fully uh, up in the sun there, or it's all the way up in the top of the canopy, um, those are all part of the same generation. And what we see here are trees expressing different genetic potential to reach that canopy and grow at a certain rate. So it's not uncommon to walk into a forest and find a tree um, of one age, let's say 60 years old, and it's uh, you know 16 inches in diameter like the tree in front of us in this photo. And then if we were to look at those trees that are much smaller, four inches, six inches, eight inches in diameter, and may not be in the canopy, may be suppressed in the understory, if we count the rings, they're actually also 60 years old. Um, and so again, when we're harvesting mushroom logs from a forest like this, we can pull out some of these smaller diameter trees, and that can be really beneficial in a practice we call um, timber stand improvement, where we're harvesting out um, trees that aren't going to be in the forest for the long term. They're already eventually going to get shaded out, and we can harvest and use those for mushrooms. The likelihood, depending on the age of the forest, is that they're, they might have a, a bit more sapwood, uh, a bit more heartwood um, than some other scenarios, but it's certainly a very important and valuable way to, to support forest health. Let's contrast that uh, kind of um, mixed diameter forest to this is another maple sapling uh, stand on a, a <clears throat> local land trust uh, near where I live. And this is a, a sort of a very even age, even diameter, I should say. Again, all, trees all the same age, but the diameter much more similar. This is a really great space because most of these trees have grown in open light and are probably really high in their sapwood concentration because they're essentially not sitting underneath a tree uh, for 50 years, just sort of collecting a, a bit of wood each year, right? They're growing at a rapid pace and, and, and some thinning in here would benefit the residual trees. You could also find plenty of potential mushroom bolts in this kind of scenario. You know, so here's some ideals, here's some ways, you know, we can find um, fresher, newer wood, both in kind of these different scenarios we might come across. We can also think about the tops of trees as being fresher wood and newer wood. And so the sapwood's gonna be higher in the tops of larger trees. And so we might wanna to try to target some of these as we um, source our logs for mushroom cultivation. All right, so some examples. Um, when we first arrived at our farm, we have a small sugar bush. We did a timber stand improvement. It was easy to recognize the trees that were doing well. So it was about a 65 year old forest at that time. Um, and so we pulled out the small diameter wood that was suppressed in the understory and used that to start our mushroom operation. Logs are still perfectly productive, um, perhaps a little more heartwood again than sapwood, but um, that's what we got. And we saw the benefit really in the residual trees over the years as we've, as we've continued to harvest uh, maple sap from them. We see a lot of folks um, keeping an eye out for local logging jobs and often the tops are left after logging. And I mentioned the tops are usually quite high in sapwood content. So you can sometimes go in or connect with a landowner 
um, and find an opportunity to harvest uh, some of this top wood, which is often the right diameter uh, for mushroom production. You don't have to worry about felling the trees um, if that's a concern or you don't have the equipment or the skill to do that. Um, and you can harvest some really good quality logs. Um, and this is a residual again of hopefully good sustainable management that can be done well um, in forests. And so this can be a great place to find uh, mushroom materials or source them. So, you know, with all these kind of considerations in mind, I don't want you to uh, walk away from this uh, stressing about the, the, the amount of sapwood in your log. Um, our research over about 12 years at Cornell, um, back sort of late 90s into the, into the um, 2010s, uh, I guess, uh, kind of time frame, we focused a lot on log grown shiitake. We did not even think about the sort of sapwood ratio. We just got the wood that we could get. A lot of it came from our research forest, the Arnott forest, where we know a lot of the wood was from those suppressed understory situations where probably there was a bit more heartwood than is ideal, but we still got really great yields. And these yields have panned out um, across the research we did there, as well as research we did with growers um, on their farms all around the Northeast. And in those trials, we did not look at sapwood to hardwood ratio. So the take home message is, if you can access wood that is more open grown or has that potential to have more sapwood is, is essentially younger, uh, reaching those diameters of four to eight inches for shiitake logs, you know, go for it. If not, don't fret about it, but do pay attention to what's going on inside the wood. Um, but these are just some production numbers. These are all available on our website um, from our research, which again, did not focus on the specific growing conditions. We just got the logs that we could and grew mushrooms. And um, we found this on our farm to pan out over time, that every time we soak a log, we get an average of about a third of a pound of mushrooms per log uh, per soak, okay? If you're not familiar with the dynamics of managing mushroom logs, you can dig into that more at the, the cornellmushrooms.org website. So, um, in it, so that, that kind of breaks down the, the log qualities and the forest connection um, and consider uh, what that could be. Um, we're gonna talk about pricing next. And I wanna give a plug to our friends, research collaborators and, and folks who have been in the log grown mushroom world for a while at Field and Forest Products in Wisconsin. The, a lot of this, um, the numbers on this slide come from their work, um, connecting with um, the forestry industry and mushroom growers in Wisconsin to try to help support um, the facilitation of flow of logs for, for growers from, from different um, from different forests around the state. So their approach was to think about a cord wood, um, uh, that sort of volume that is synonymous with a lot of firewood sales and figure out how many three foot bolts. So typically a bolt for mushroom cultivation is again, four to eight inches in diameter and about three feet long. So they, they did the math and um, figured out that um, there's about 153 foot bolts in a cord of wood. And a cord of wood is not a great <laughs> measure. It'd be much more accurate to do a, a weight measure or something like that, but it gives you a bit of a ballpark. And it's, it's frankly something that a good chunk of um, the sort of uh, populace is familiar with, right? So these are prices, these are not prices that we post or recommend. Prices are something that are negotiated between the seller and the buyer, but these are prices that um, we've seen show up and our example prices, considering the amount of labor on the buyer's end versus the, the seller's end. So in some cases, um, you might go in after a logging job or someone might go in after a logging job and um, work with a landowner or the logging company themselves and do salvage work of tops. And in some cases, I've done that for free and I've known others that have. Sometimes you pay a little bit of a fee and um, and you could do you know 50 cents per bolt for that, okay? Um, potentially those logs could be brought to the land, the landing roadside, something like that, and you could get uh, or, or negotiate for maybe a dollar per bolt. Um, what we typically see if the bolts are cut, you know, moved, transported, and delivered to a farm, that's typically two to three dollars per bolt is something that's a common price. There may be a delivery charge tacked on to that if it's outside of a certain radius. Again, that's up to the seller to set their price based on uh, what they think the logs are worth. Sometimes we've seen logs um, cost more like four or five dollars. Um, a piece if it's a long distance or something like that. Um, and then sometimes we've seen folks price more per linear foot if they're delivering um, in six foot or nine foot or um, uh, 12 foot um, logs, um, they, might, they might do it more of a price per linear foot. And again, if they can handle them without damaging the bark, it's perfectly acceptable. So 
all this said, there's a lot of factors. And again, it's up to the seller to figure out what price works best for them. Um, a delivery outfit, you know, if you're delivering uh, bolts at that two or three dollars a price, you know, uh, two two or three dollars per bolt delivered, um, that might work out to about three hundred to four hundred dollars, four hundred fifty dollars a cord um, in terms of the price. So that's pretty good. That's that's a significant markup from from regular firewood. You're not having to split it necessarily or cure it. <clears throat> um, but you are having to handle the logs um, significantly with, with a lot more tenderness than normal. So I've had folks say, that's not worth it for me. I've had folks say, this is a great price. I just uh, this year sourced some logs from a local uh, local neighbor who we, we negotiated and agreed on 275 and that worked for him. And that's, he has access to things. It's an easy thing for him um, um, and, and it worked out for him. And that's what's important is at the end of the day, you agree on a price that works for for, for both um, ends. The thing I want to say about pricing, though, and, and, and also is to be really clear about what, what it looks like um, and, and what you agree on from the beginning. Again, before the logs show up, you want to have all these things really clear with folks. Um, and we have a fact sheet that can help describe some of these considerations so that you're really clear before, before any agreement is, is actually made. Um, and I will say, uh, as a price comparison, just to go back one slide, um, <clears throat> we, we did figure out when we looked at the cost cost per log. Um, we looked at labor for harvesting the log, and this was a per log uh, kind of breakdown. Um, and we mentioned sort of you, you might purchase that log for two or three dollars, but basically um, uh, it, it sort of uh, breaks even in terms of your labor to harvest the log or or the potential of, of having that log delivered at two or three dollars per log. It's sort of a wash. And, and I say that with a grain of salt because if you're familiar with uh, heading out into the woods, thinking you're going to cut some trees down and get some logs gone um, for the day, you might hang up the first tree you cut and suddenly now the rest of your day is just getting one tree onto the ground safely. Um, so of course, efficiency, um, access with good equipment, um, the skill set, all those factors play in. And when we worked with growers, you know, um, for some folks, it was a big loss for them to, to harvest their own logs versus buying them in. And for others, um, because they like the work or because they can do it efficiently, it was a gain. So those are really important factors to consider. Um, so when we think about customers, who's looking for logs, um, folks that don't have access to woodlots, of course, uh, we do a lot of work um, in urban areas and there's a lot of interest in this. And this is actually something we are working to figure out how to pilot, how, how we can facilitate some log movement from more rural areas to more urban areas. Um, that's a potential customer. Um, again, don't have the skills, tools, or even desire to move and fell logs. Um, some folks are happy to spend all day in the woods and don't even care how long it takes. Some others don't want to do it or don't have the time. Um, on our farm with our uh, production system, we've had a mix of um, years where we have time to harvest our own logs and sometimes, or our own bolts, I should say, and sometimes we don't have any time and so we, we source them from someone else. So all different factors. The pie chart on here is just from our <clears throat> previous work with shiitake growers around the Northeast. This was the average um, sort of percentage of time it took <clears throat> for different tasks related to shiitake cultivation. So you can see the felling of the trees and the harvesting, or excuse me, that's the harvesting the mushrooms. The felling of the trees um, is about 12% of, of time. So 10% of your time, um, that was averaged across several growers with different skill sets. So it can be a significant chunk of time to consider um, how, you wanna, how you wanna go about doing that um, in your enterprise, if that's what you're doing. Um, I've really been uh, fortunate to interact with a lot of growers and see a lot of different ways that folks think creatively about the, the product, uh, the wood, the log, the bolt, and how they can um, integrate it into a commercial enterprise. So sometimes we see um, <clears throat> people actually um, uh, contracting out the, the logging uh, for mushroom logs if they have the land, but they don't have the skills or the time or interest, they might find someone locally who wants to do that. Just like you might find someone to build you a shed, um, as long as they're carrying insurance and they're covering uh, those kind of risks, I, I think that's a, a great potential. And you could offer that as a service. In addition to providing logs, you could say, I'll come on your land and, and harvest them right there for you if that's of interest. We've seen farmers do that and, and other folks in the wood products industry. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, folks getting into sort of the, the ready to fruit logs. Um, you know, it's about an additional input of about $5 in materials and time to do that inoculation. We usually see folks sell them, I used to say 10 to $20 a log. I've seen even upwards of 30 or 40, depending on your market and what they're interested in paid for. Um, 
you can sell that log as ready to fruit. Um, usually that log, when we say ready to fruit, it means it's gone through that initial incubation that, that usually waiting about a year. Um, and often these logs are sold at sort of holiday markets. Um, and so we've seen several farmers in our network um, do quite well with, with holiday logs or, or ready to fruit logs. And so that could again be part of an enterprise that, that um, maximizes value out of that, that product, um, that, that wood product. We've seen folks offer log inoculation as an educational um, opportunity, you know, not so much in the last year, of course, but um, hopefully moving forward, that'll be uh, more and more possible. Um, people love uh, getting the hands-on experience and that's something you can uh, potentially add into to the mix of things if you're interested in doing that. Um, and then we've also seen uh, folks actually be contracted to basically set up a, a fruiting yard, what we call a, a mushroom grow operation in someone's woods as, as sort of a consultant in that form. So they bring the wood, they do the inoculation, they set it up, they get the, the soaking tank going, all that kind of stuff. So I add these things in just to mention that um, if you're thinking about, you know, do I want to be a, a seller of logs, there's also other ways to kind of work off that. And you could potentially have a small side income without actually even focusing on, you know, fruiting and selling fresh mushrooms, which is often what folks are coming to our program for. But there's a lot of um, sort of side, side hustles or sideways that you could um, additionally think about the, the value of, of the, the wood as a product. So just a couple of regulatory things and then I'll share some resources. Um, one question that came up really early when we started talking about log transport was, um, if firewood hauling regulations um, apply to mushroom logs. And um, New York State instituted a 50 mile limit to movement of firewood. I think it was back in 2010. The wood products industry um, protested quite a bit about the, the sort of original stipulations, which were quite um, uh, all encompassing. And eventually in 2012, I believe, New York State. Um, sort of said agricultural and, and wood products are not included. This is, a, this is a ban focused on consumer level firewood. All right, so, so technically by the letter of the law and you could have uh, different discussions about um, the implications of this, um, mushroom bolts are not considered firewood. They're not consumer firewood. And so they're, they do not, um, they're not required to, to uh, be withheld within that 50 mile radius in terms of hauling. Now, what I will say is it's not gonna make sense, uh, I think uh, from a fuel or time standpoint to get your logs from much further than that. So I think you still wanna source your logs as close to home. And of course, um, one of the reasons that this ban was uh, originally instituted and, and is maintained is because we wanna reduce the spread of noxious um, pests and, and diseases that affect our woodlands. And that's still a really important value. The assumption with folks in the agriculture or wood products world is that they're uh, more familiar with some of these potential harm uh, factors and paying attention to them in, in the woods and would, would take care not to transport something that might be potentially um, compromised. So that's the intention there. Again, regulation sometimes is about reading the letter of the law and the letter of the law is that uh, 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 agricultural product would not fall under a burn ban. I will not speak for other states other than New York. Um, uh, but I did uh, work several years ago. This is back in like 2015. We did a whole thing with the Eastern plant uh, regulators talking about um, um, fungus and, and wood and transport of wood. So I went to a conference and we, we created a paper and, and we did look at some different state regulations. So for now, I would say that the most important thing is we're not ever transporting logs across state lines because regulations really differ from state to state. And then you want to check with your local regional and statewide mandates and just consider that. And I think um, best practice is to follow those mandates as best you can and be aware um, of some of the potential risks. So some examples here of some tree species and some of the invasive species that are of concern with these. Um, oak wilt, I will say, is something that um, was really only showing up in, in more southern states and now is definitely moving up. Um, I know it's more prevalent in our region of New York. So. Um, so keep those things in mind that these things are always changing and we wanna limit the risk as much as possible. It's not just about following or not following regulation, it's about also limiting any spread. So, um, so making sure that uh, you're well-versed in any kind of issues, that if you're sourcing logs, you're gonna be taking these things in consideration. Again, talk to your local extension uh, about um, species or outbreaks of concern and make sure you're minimizing that risk as you go. But again, in New York State, as far as reading the letter of the law, you're not sort of um, underneath that firewood regulation in terms of hauling. Uh, 
There is some information on our website that links to the DC stuff. So you can dig up on that. I guess it was actually 2009 when that regulation was introduced. I was pretty close off by a year. Um, one of the things they recommend in there or they require of firewood haulers is that they have what's called a self-issued certificate of origin, which is basically just a pa paper trail to, to document what's going on. So if you were moving logs around, this might be a good idea. Um, document what's going on. Um, and, and have that paperwork with you, just in case there's a question. And what we find with regulators is sometimes what is known or, or discussed on the state level is not always known on the, on the regional or the local level. So again, be, a used, uh, be an informed user, make sure you're, you're covering and understanding those things. And there's links on the website to help you dig into that a bit more. Um, so ideally we get our logs from as close as possible and we reduce that, that risk overall over time. Um, one, you know, one factor too is to consider is that if there were there were some most of these pest uh, outbreaks, if they were visible on the logs you're getting, um, they wouldn't be um, very suitable for mushroom cultivation anyway. So there'd be a, there'd be an inherent problem in, in a, there's an inherent conflict there um, in terms of the type of product we're trying to buy. So some resources um, we have. Uh, a fact sheet. This is something you can download as a PDF and print off and um, share with folks uh, you might be selling logs to or potentially purchasing logs from is a way to kind of describe all the key um, points that were covered in this presentation that's available on our website to use as as is useful for you. We are uh, reinstating a map that we had on our old website. We did a pretty large website overhaul two years ago and, and some of the fallout of that was some of these um, projects we couldn't maintain, but we are going to revive the, the log sourcing map. Um, and so there is a form on our website. If you filled out that form previously, we're going to ask you to fill it out again, just so we have your updated information. The goal with this is, uh, and we're actually expanding it beyond New York State into much of the Northeast. So what we'll do is publish a link to a map online where you can look um, geographically to where you might find someone um, who's interested in selling uh, mushroom logs. And you can get in touch with them and have a conversation about logistics and pricing and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we're just providing that as a resource and sort of like a, a classified listing, right? So if you go to this map, um, click on one of the pins. This is just an example. I put put my, <laughs> my information. I don't sell logs, but I just kind of put my name in. And just to show you, um, it'll describe, you know, how they would like to be contacted, um, what they're offering, their delivery radius, um, pricing, um, what species they can provide, sort of things like that, and any other details they want to share, right? And then it's up to you to get in touch with them and, and negotiate from there. So we're just providing this as a as a way to to do a linkage, okay? So if you're in the Northeast, any of the Northeast states, you can um, head over to the form. If you want to offer your logs for sale, you will have a public listing on here, and folks will probably start to contact you about that. And our plan moving forward is we can kind of recommit to what we were doing a few years back, which is updating this map um, probably every two weeks or so. Uh, we'll try to try to aim for that um, so that new listings can get added and people can find this as a resource. So that's on there. Um, and then on our page as well, again, go to cornellmushrooms.org and click on find suppliers, or you can go to the link at the bottom of the slide. You'll find the recording from this webinar the, the webinar I mentioned from Peter Smolage and the, the various listings, um, the, the forms and the map and things I, I mentioned will be posted to this uh, location. Finally, um, this is just one of several webinars we offer. We have webinars that we've done in past years posted to our YouTube channel, again, linked from our main website. Uh, and we also have a series of webinars coming up here in 2021. So I just wanna point those out real quick. Our next one's in April. Uh, we're talking about building community with fungi. So hearing from community organizations uh, using fungi in their programming. And then we have some nice topics coming up through the end of the year that I'm excited to, to have us share out on. So um, if you go to our specialty mushrooms page again, click on events, you can sign up for the webinars. And if you're in the webinar today, you've already signed up. So you'll get the link to the next webinar um, as, as it comes available. Okay, so with that, I'm going to stop my recording.